So we want to solve for y, which means we are looking for the solution to this differential equation, dy dx equals xy, that quantity squared. And we have an initial condition given to us that y is one when x is one. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to get all of the y terms to the left-hand side, keep all the x terms on the right, and bring the dx to the right. So in order to do that, I think it's helpful for us to rewrite this as just x squared, y squared, throw that squared onto both of those, since that's how that works. Everybody good with that? Yeah. And as we separate the variables, we should have dy on the left with what? Should be dy over y squared. Y squared. And on the right hand side, we should have what? dx over x squared. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, x squared over dx. That dx is coming over, so it's being multiplied. So it's actually also up in the numerator. And that's the nice thing that when we bring the dx over, that dx will always be in the numerator. Because if we have a dx in the denominator, that's not something we'll be able to integrate. So it's just kind of like a cross multiplying. Multiply by the dx, divide by the y squared, and you got them all separated. Does that make sense to everyone? Or no? Yeah. Okay. So how do we integrate dy over y squared? Would it be negative one over y? Negative one over y. And I know we talked about this yesterday. It's got a constant added to it, right? And so will the other side. And so since we're going to have a constant on both sides, it's not necessary for us to put it on both sides. We'll just put it on the side with the x normally. Because right? if I had constant one over here, and constant two over here, right? I can subtract the constant one over and cancel them out and just have the singular constant on one side. So we'll do that. And as I just did the integral of x squared is x cubed over three. So we got negative one over y equals x cubed over three plus a constant. Everybody good with that? Yeah. OK. Next step, um, some textbooks and um, some places will tell you that they want you to solve for y first and then find the constant. But I think it's that lends itself to making a lot of arithmetic errors. I think it's a lot better if you just plug in your x and your y immediately and find your constant right away. So negative 1 over y equals 1 cubed over 3 plus our constant. And so what does our constant become? Negative one minus one third is? Negative four over three. Oh, good, okay. So now this should become negative one over y equals x cubed over three minus four over three. And how are we gonna end up solving that for y? negative reciprocal of the other side. Yep. And since this has got the same denominator there, we could rewrite this. I'll, I'll do this in multiple steps. We could rewrite this like this. Um, and then we could take the reciprocal, giving us this. And then we just multiply by a negative. Good or no?
Yeah, snow, maybe. Okay. Um, and yes. what is the problem with this answer? What have we not done? Yeah, to find the domain. Right, the domain or the one on which this particular part of it is valid. So this x cubed minus four lends itself to a discontinuity. It can't equal zero, right? So x cubed can't be four or x cannot be the cube root of four. Good or no? So our domain itself is negative infinity to the cube root of four, cube root of four to infinity, but we only want the part that includes our initial condition, which is x equals one. And so if we're talking about negative infinity to cube root of four, or cube root of four to infinity, which one of those includes x equals one? Negative infinity to cube root of four. Yep. This includes x equals one. So we'll say this is valid for negative infinity to the cube root of four. So don't forget the interval on which it's valid. Good or no? Any questions, any issues? Everyone's all right with that? Yeah. All right, let's do another one. What should we do first? Get y and x on separate sides. Okay, so get the y to the left, do y over y, and get the x to the right, which should be dx over x. Yeah, everybody good with that? Yeah. Yes. Then we'll integrate. What's the integral of dy over y? It's a natural mm -hmm. log of y. Should be natural log of the absolute value y. And this should be natural log absolute value of x plus the constant. And if we plug in y equals 2 and x equals 2, we get a constant of 0. Everybody good there? Yeah. Well, cool. all right. So now we'll just say natural log absolute value y is equal to natural log absolute value of x. And if we're talking about when x is 2 and when y is 2, are those absolute values going to be necessary? No, they won't. They won't because those are already positive. And how do we solve for y? How do we get y by itself if we have natural log of y? Express it in terms of e. Exactly. So we it's called exponentiating it, right? We make it as a power of e 
and e to the ln y is just y, and e to the ln x is just x. And so we end up with y equals x. <clears throat> but just getting y equals x isn't good enough. There's no discontinuities on y equals x. But we have to go back to all the different pieces of where we, um, what our function looked like after we integrated. And in this case, what can x not be? Zero. Exactly. And so any restriction on x anywhere along the way after the integration has to be included in our final domain restrictions. And so if x can't be zero, that means we're just looking at negative infinity to zero and zero to infinity, and which one of those includes our initial condition. Zero, to, zero infinity. to infinity. Zero to infinity. Excellent. Good or no? So make sure as you go through, you check each step along the way to make sure there aren't any discontinuities. Because just because we ended up with y equals x at the end, a nice easy one, that clearly doesn't have any discontinuities, it doesn't mean that there aren't discontinuities elsewhere. Good or no? Good. All right. Um, you guys want to try and do one on your own? Yeah. All right. And then we'll probably do one more together after this also, or maybe I'll have you do two on your own. But I'll give you, uh, I don't know, two or three minutes here, three or four minutes to work on this one. Should be good enough. Ready, go. All right, how'd you separate the variables to start with? You had dy over y plus five, hopefully. And then hopefully x plus two dx. Does that look right? Yes. Okay. And then we integrated both sides of it. The integral of the left-hand side, that's a simple u substitution integral, but what does it come out to be? Should be just natural log absolute value y plus five. And on the right-hand side? <clears throat> one half x squared plus two x. One half x squared plus two x plus our constant, right? And we plugged in zero for x and one for y to give us natural log of six equals zero plus zero plus our constant. So our constant was ln six. Good or no? Why wouldn't we multiply the uh, y plus five and x plus two terms rather than just, or, I, I'm, I'm saying why wouldn't we do that? What do you mean, like distribute them out? You would would we distribute that out or um... no? Definitely don't want okay. it because if you do that, there's no way to separate the variables so that all the y's and all the x's are on one side. Um, because you okay, five x plus two y plus um, plus x y plus ten, and so you get that one term that's got both the x and the y plus a bunch of other things, so you can't separate them out. So you always want to just separate them as quickly as you can to get the y's on one side and the x's on the other. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, cool. So um, now we'll plug in our c equals ln six, and we'll have natural log absolute value y plus five equals x squared over two plus two x plus ln six. And how do we get rid of that natural log? Natural log of Just like in the last one, what did we do? Exponentiate. Exponentiate, exactly. So we'll exponentiate it. E to the ln of something is just that something. So absolute value y plus five. And over here, we've got E to the x squared over two plus two x plus ln six. Okay. So now a couple of little things we got to do here. First off, um, the absolute value of y plus five, how can I just turn that into y plus five? What do I have to do to the right-hand side? The other side is positive or negative. Right, the other side will become a positive or a negative, so plus or minus. And then 
just real quick, I'm going to give us another page for this, just to write something out. We had this, right? E to the x squared over 2 plus 2x two plus ln 6. Well, that's e to the a plus b plus c. True? e to the something plus something else plus something else. Couldn't I rewrite that as e to the a plus b times e to the c? Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to use that idea. I could also write it as e to the a times e to the b times e to the c, but leaving those two up there is fine. Because what can I do if I rewrite this as e to the x squared over 2 plus 2x two times e to the ln 6? e to the ln 6 can just become 6. six. So we've now got y plus 5 equals 6 plus or minus. Sorry, that's 6 plus or minus. That was awful by me. Plus or minus 6 e to the x squared over 2 plus 2x. Two and then subtract the 5 to get y equals negative 5 plus or minus 6e to the x squared over 2 plus 2x. And two things we got to do with this. The first thing we got to do with this is figure out if it's plus or if it's minus. How do we determine if we want the plus or the minus? Plus. Because we can't have both. We plug in those values. Plug in our initial condition, right? If I put in zero for x and one for y, What do I need? Do I need the plus or do I need the minus? The plus. I need the plus. So our final result here should be y equals negative 5 plus 6e to the x squared over 2 plus 2x. And if we think about any restrictions on the domain of x here, um, can I take any value of x and square it and then divide it by 2 and then add that to 2 times that x value? I could do that. I could do any do these operations to any x value. And I could raise e to any power and multiply 6 by any number and do negative 5 plus any number. So there are no domain restrictions for this one. Good or no? Good. Great. All right. Let's do another one. So I'll get you guys partway started on this one, because this one doesn't quite look like a separable differential equation to start with, but it is. We've got e to the x minus y. And so <clears throat> we could rewrite that using exponent rules, and that's often something you need to do. What would we rewrite it as? It would be e to x over... E to the x over e to the y. All right, so I'll give you guys a minute or so here and have you solve this differential equation. So get the y terms to the left, the x terms on the right, integrate and solve for y. And you'll find your constant. So that shouldn't take more than probably three minutes or so, I'm guessing. Ready to go. So separate your variables to get e to the y dy equals e to the x dx. Two very, very easy integrals to complete, right? They both just stay the same. We get constants on one side. And so we plug in our y equals 2 and our x equals 0 to get a constant of what? e squared minus 1. So we then have e to the y equals e to the x plus e squared minus 1. And how do I get rid of e to the y and just make it y? The natural log. Take the natural log. Natural log of, and does this go into an absolute value when I do my natural log? No. No. A lot of people start 
putting things in absolute values anytime they're inside of a natural log now because of the integration when we do that. So just make sure you don't start doing things that don't make any sense. Um, and what about restrictions on the domain of this? I could take the natural log of anything that is positive, right? So as long as this e to the x plus e squared minus one is always positive, then that's okay. But if there's values where it's negative, it's not okay. So what can you tell me about e to the x plus e squared minus one? It's positive. It should always be positive because e to the x is always positive and e squared is always greater than the minus one. And so this is always positive. So this is our answer. Good or no? All right, real quick, um, we're gonna do one little thing. So write this down. Read this for a second, I'll be back. I gotta do one thing real quick. So I'll be back in like two minutes. All right, so um, one of the applications of these differential equations that we've been doing um, is something that you're actually hopefully familiar with already, which is exponential growth and decay. You're all familiar with exponential growth and decay? And decay? Like, I am a scientist and I have bacteria in a petri dish and it is multiplying very rapidly at an exponential rate, exponential growth, right? Or these rabbits are multiplying at an exponential rate or something like I've got, you know, I'm doing carbon dating to test how old something is and you test how, how long it takes for the radioactive nuclei and something to um, disappear, to decay. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So that whole idea of exponential growth and exponential change comes directly from a differential equation in which the change in some variable, doesn't matter what variable, we'll call it y, and the change in y with respect to time, dy dt, is equal to some constant, k, times that same variable that we had up in our dy dt. So the change in a variable is proportional to the amount of that variable that you have. And so that's kind of like, you know, you think about the, the basic idea of like exponential growth where you probably the first thing you ever learn is like, we have two rabbits and in three days we now have, you know, six rabbits and then we have 87 rabbits and they grow really quickly, right? Well, they grow more quickly because there are more rabbits. The change in the number of rabbits is proportional to the number of rabbits that you have that are breeding with each other, right? Does that make sense? And so that's what we've got here is we have the change in y is proportional to the amount of y. And so what we should be able to do with this differential equation is we should be able to separate the variables and solve it using integration to get the exponential growth and decay formula that you learned about way back in like third grade or something, whenever you originally learned about it. So I know it's not a dy dx, it's a dy dt, but that's fine. We'll still bring our y to the left side. We'll keep our constant on the right. You could bring it to the left if you wanted, but it makes the arithmetic simpler if we leave it on the right. And we'll bring the dt to the right. So when we integrate this, what should we get? What do you get if you integrate dy over y? natural log of absolute value y. Natural log of absolute value y. And what do you get if you integrate k, a constant, dt? Kt. Kt. 
plus some constant c, right? We always get that constant c. And so now if we were to go ahead and solve this for y, we'd raise these as powers of e, we'd exponentiate them, right? Which would give us absolute value y equals e to the kt plus some other constant. And if we're talking about exponential growth and exponential decay, we're always talking about an, an amount of something, an amount of bacteria, amount of rabbits, amount of radioactive nuclei present in some radioactive isotope of some chemical element. Um, we always have something. So when I take this out of the absolute value, the plus or minus, we don't really need to worry about because there's never going to be a negative amount of something. We end up with something like this, y equals e to the kt times e to the c. And what's e to the c? e to the c is just a constant, isn't it? And there is something cool about this particular constant, e to the c, which is sometimes written as just an a. Um, what is the value of this constant? Anybody know? I'm just going to call it equal to a. So I'd write this as y equals a e to the kt. If you think back to your um, years of studying exponential growth and decay, what does that variable in front of the e to the kt represent? The initial amount? That's right, it's the initial amount. We should be able to prove that that's true. Because if t equals zero, then y should be the initial amount of y, right? Or the initial amount of the subject, y should equal y naught. And if we replace y with y naught and t with zero, we get y naught equals a. So we end up with y equals the initial amount e to the kt. And that's the exponential growth and decay formula that some math or science teacher told you and said plug in these numbers and figure it out. Well, now you know where it comes from. It comes from a separable differential equation. Y equals y not e to the kt. And sometimes um, we'll have a negative value there, right? If it's a negative kt, then you have exponential decay. And if you have positive kt, then it's exponential growth. But the k value itself is always some positive constant. You might put a negative in front of it to indicate decay, or there might not be a negative in front of it, which indicates that it's exponential growth, not decay. Good or no? We're going to do two other quick little things with this. Well, really just one. But um, first off, you probably are moderately familiar with this in terms of compounding interest, right? You've seen the compounding interest formulas yeah, before. Yeah, yeah we're not going to do any problems with those, but just those also come from this. Okay. But what we are going to do is we are going to figure out what the half-life of any radioactive element is or find a formula to figure it out. So the half-life just means it takes half of what we originally had um, to decay. It's how long it takes for half of the original amount of the radioactive nuclei to get, to disappear, to dissipate, to decay, which would mean that our final amount should be one half of our initial amount if we're looking for the half life. And you'll note that instead of having a kT, I put a negative kT in there because we are having exponential decay. Make sense? So if I were to solve this for t, it should give me a formula that represents the half-life in terms of k for any radioactive element. So all we have to do is divide both sides of this by the constant, y naught, giving us e to the negative kt equals 1 half. And then how do we solve that for t?
Take the natural log of both sides. Take the natural log of both sides. And the natural log of e to the negative kt is just negative kt. And the natural log of a half, um, we could rewrite as this, natural log of one minus natural log of two using log rules. Natural log of one is, Zero. Zero. So that goes away. We have negative kt equals negative ln2, or kt equals ln2, or the half-life t, or any radioactive element is always equal to natural log of 2 over k. So if I were to say, for example, this differential equation, dy dt equals negative 0.0077y, models how quickly SM151 decays, and I want to know what its half-life is, the half-life should just be the natural log of 2 divided by k. And we know this is decaying, which is why there's a negative sign there. And what's our k value? Should just be 0 0.0077 coming straight from that differential equation. And we should be able to just plug it in and find the approximate half-life rounded to three decimals of this particular element. And what do you get? Ninety point oh nine one nine oh one nine. Cool. That makes sense to everybody how we found the k value and just used the formula that we derived. Cool. That's it.